wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله السميرة من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عنوان إلا على الظالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا and welcome you all back to Quran 30 for 30 we're joined tonight by the one and only Sheikh Muhammad Shanawi Abu Abad uh, very very happy to have you on with us. Uh, SubhanAllah, he's been doing a Qur'an series, some of you might have seen his Qur'an series actually with uh, Jesus, the son of Mary, Masjid in, uh, in in Pennsylvania, maybe you can talk about it at the end if we have some time, inshallah, and uh, is also taking out some time to join us, inshallah ta'ala, for three nights. I just want to make sure I say it on camera, so in case you try to change it to two and say you got busy, committed to three nights, inshallah ta'ala, with us in these uh, 30 days for Qur'an, uh, 30 for 30, bi'inillahi ta'ala. Um, Inshallah Ta'ala, we, we go ahead and we start uh, right right away with uh, Juz 12. And Juz 12 includes most of Surah Hud as well as the first half of Surah Yusuf. And Surah Yusuf is obviously a very special surah for many reasons. And it touches upon so many notes that um, I, I'm sure that each one of us has some sort of reflection on it. SubhanAllah, that's going to uh, hopefully uh, you know, reflect something that is a benefit to everybody. But I want to talk about Surah Yusuf as is situated with Surah Yunus and Surah Hud. Uh, first of all, quiz question, which I'll, uh, I'll see if anyone's able to answer it for tomorrow, which is if you notice something about the first ayah of every one of these surahs, uh, and inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, and inshallah ta'ala, there's a string of surahs where the first ayah has a common theme. So inshallah ta'ala, you all will be able uh, to catch it. Uh, surah Hud is a very, very special surah in that it presses upon us a great sense of urgency and it had a special significance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a way of, uh, in a way of causing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam great distress over the fate of his ummah and, and the fate of his qawm, his people that he was calling uh, to. Uh, there's a very famous narration where Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, noticed that there were some gray hairs that had, uh, that had shown in the hair of the Prophet sallallahu And he said, Qad asra that suddenly I've noticed, Ya Rasulullah, O Messenger of Allah, that you have gray hairs. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu said, Shayyabatni hud wa akhawatuha, that it was Surah Hud and its sisters, uh, Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Surah Al-Mursalat, Surah Al-Naba, Surah Al-Takweer. Uh, surahs like this that cause the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's hair to uh, ap uh, appear with some grayness for the first time. Why? Ibn Abbas Anhu says because of a very specific ayah, the general theme of Surah Hud as well as a very specific ayah. The theme of Surah Hud is the destruction of nations after they've been given all the warnings. And so up until this point, you've heard of the warnings, the different types of warnings, the different types of deviations. And then now you see the destruction of those nations. And the Prophet ﷺ was fearful for his nation that the punishment uh, was coming uh, to his nation. Ibn Abbas he said that the ayah 112, that be firm as you have been commanded and those that have turned back to Allah with you and do not, do not turn back. Verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all seeing and all knowing. And so it was a reminder to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, that, that they had reached a stage at this point and this is towards the end of, uh, of Mecca. So it's the hardest. Ibn Abbas sallallahu ta'ala who said that there is no surah and no ayah in particular that came down to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that was more difficult than this particular uh, ayah. The call to istiqama, the call to be firm in the face of great adversity, and the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sensing that a great calamity is about to befall his people uh, in the midst of all of this, and of course the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam always concerned about whether or not, um, or, or always concerned with Allah's pleasure and concerned with staying the course. And if he was concerned with that sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then where should we be? So I'll give you sort of a, a, an overview of the surah, right? Um, 25 to 35 of Surah Hud is Nuh alayhi salam addressing his people, his people challenging him. And then 36, uh, verse 36 to 39, Allah commands Nuh alayhi salam to build the safina, build the ark. And then 40 to 41, 
um, Nuh alayhi salam is commanded to embark uh, upon that, that, uh, that, that ark with the believers. And then you see the destruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala coming to the people of Nuh, uh, Nuh alayhi salam. Then you see the, the uh, address of Hud alayhi salam to his people, their disbelief and their consequences, the destruction of the people of Hud. Then the people of Salih, the destruction and the disbelief of the people of Salih. Then the people of Lut alayhi salam. Lut alayhi salam addressing his people, the destruction, the consequences of the people of Lut alayhi salam. Then the Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam, the destruction and the consequences of the people of Shu'aib. Then Fir'aun, right, also destroyed uh, in that way. So it's going through the destroyed nations. And there is a connection then as it goes into Surah Yusuf that we should talk about here. Yunus alayhi salam left his people and they came back to Allah. Hud alayhi salam, uh, stayed with his people and his people fled from Allah, right? So Yunus alayhi salam left his people and he came back and found them having repented and turned back to Allah. Hud alayhi salam insisted on calling his people and they were uh, destroyed. Yusuf alayhi salam was abandoned by his family and that his brothers had, uh, had, had gotten rid of him, yet he rose to power and they all repented and came back to Allah. And as a result, nations benefit from the uh, resilience and the elevation of Yusuf alayhi salam. Now, as we get into the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, Yus Yusuf also involves the intricate elements of family because rejection from family is the most difficult to bear. And it's not one that Yunus and Hud alayhi salam had to face, right? But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam had to face the rejection of family, the abandonment of family. And so the entire story of Yusuf alayhi salam, the Prophet Joseph, peace be upon him, parallels the story of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, abandoned by his brothers uh, to another nation, uh, a place of uncertainty where he rises to power and prominence and then comes back and the people all gather around him. Uh, accusation, slander, the different types of things and elements of the challenges that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had faced. There's also the elements of envy. Ya'qub Alaihi Wasallam, Jacob saying to his son, لا تقصص رؤياك على إخواتك فيكيدوا لك كيدا that they will be jealous of the position that Allah has given to you if you narrate your dream to them. What did Abu Jahl say about Banu Hashim, the Pharaoh of this Ummah? He said that we feed, us as in Banu Makhzum, we feed and they feed. We compete with them in hospitality and we, sometimes they're more hospitable than us, sometimes we're more hospitable than them. But where are we going to get a prophet from? If we acknowledge that he's a prophet of God, we can't win this battle, right? It, that's it. So the same level of envy um, that the Prophet ﷺ would face, that he was envied because of the potential threat to power and position. And that's why his brothers would abandon him despite his noble and beautiful character, alayhi salatu wasalam. Also, as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said, that there is no person who had more tahawwal, more switching in the blessings in his life than Yusuf alayhi salam. He went from, uh, fr from being the favorite child to being a an abandoned brother, to being a slave, to being a prisoner, to being a king. And the Prophet Sallallahu also faced every situation in terms of how we interact with blessing uh, in this life. Also that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, minhum la taqtulu Yusuf. Allah mentions that not all of the brothers of Yusuf were the same. And if you remember in Badr, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu said that there are some people that came out, they came to fight us, but they just went along with the flow. But they're not actually there to fight us, but they were pushed. So we mentioned the Abbas, the Prophet also said, If there's any good in these people, it's in the one who, who owns uh, the red camel, talking about Utbah uh, ibn Abi Rabi'ah, who didn't want to go to battle, but Abu Jahl pushed him and insisted. So the idea that not all of your enemies are the same, Yusuf alayhi salam saying, ahabbu ilayya, that I would rather be in prison than disobey Allah. The Prophet salam, turning away every single compromise that was put towards him, saying that I would, as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with me, then I'll take all of the consequences of that belief and of that nobility. Now, I want to leave you with one gem, subhanAllah, in particular. And it blew my mind. Um, you know, last night I was, I was with my community at Valley Ranch right after this khatira. And I had uh, mentioned um, something about Surah Hud. And subhanAllah, I was just thinking about the connection tonight. And it's a beautiful connection that I personally had never uh, known before, but it's really profound. Surah Hud is the destruction of all of these nations. 
There is one bushla, one glad tidings in the entire of uh, entire surah Hut, one bushla, which is the angels telling Ibrahim alayhi salam on their way to destroy the nation of Lut alayhi salam. The angels telling Ibrahim and his wife that they're going to have a son, Isaac, and beyond Isaac, Yaqub, Jacob. This is the only bushra in the whole surah, the only glad tidings that what awaits you is Ishaq and then Yaqub. And subhanAllah, Yusuf alayhi salam, Joseph, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. SubhanAllah, it's like Yusuf alayhi salam coming out of this surah <laughs> and then being elevated to this position. And what does his father say to him? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will choose you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will perfect his blessing upon you the way that he perfected for your forefathers that came before you, Isaac and Abraham. So the ni'mah, the blessing, the only blessing that's sort of given in Surah Hud rises in the next surah from the children of Jacob, the grandson uh, of Isaac. Uh, Isaac is Haq, the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam, his son Jacob, Yaqub alayhi salam, the Bushra of Yusuf alayhi salam, and these nations, these nations that are then formulated two nations under Yusuf alayhi salam, connecting Egypt and Palestine, uh, you know, uh, in, in the case of Yusuf alayhi salam. And of course, there's a lot of the nations that are described in Surah Hud were destroyed in those areas where Yusuf alayhi salam now reigns supreme um, as, as a malik, as a king after all of this. So subhanAllah, Allah azza wa jal giving us that bushra, that one glad tiding that then shows its fruits fully in the next surah, in Surah Yusuf. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst those that, uh, that rise to the occasion that are not punished as a result of our delays or as a result of our disobedience and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds worthy of these bisharat, of, 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 these, of these, uh, these glad tidings uh, that he gives to uh, righteous people. Allahumma ameen. Shaykh Abdullah, tshadah. Jazakumullah khairan. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'd. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being al-khaliq, being that he is a creator, he knows what is most beneficial for us. And, you know, as we mentioned yesterday, huwa nafi' wa dar he is the one that brings ultimate benefit and can also bring harm, but what is, it is with an ultimate wisdom. And it's all built upon justice. And with that being the case, you know, as, you know, the Sheikh mentioned earlier, you know, all of these stories, approximately around seven prophets mentioned in the chapter of Hud, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions their voyage, mentions their journey, mentions their experience. But we always have to remember that the stories are there for a purpose. It's not just how we know as, you know, tall tales that we read and, you know, there's, there's stories that we can just relate to our children or to, to, to generations that pass on. The goal of the story is for you to internalize the morals that are, that are extracted from that story. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always makes a point to remind you of that. It's not just something just to relate, but you should relate it and stop and ask yourself, where do I stand in relation to this story? What are the characteristics that the prophets, prophets embodied and where do I stand in regards to that? And when one consistently does that, this is the process, the process of self-rejuvenation, of spiritual renewal, which the month of Ramadan is, should be a catalyst for that, a catalyst, a new beginning, not just something that's seasonal and then you go back to your original self. Rather, it's a catalyst. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in this beautiful chapter of Surah Hud, at the very end, when he talks about the reason or reasons why he relates these stories to you, to hit home. So after you've read all these stories, you know, you understand the trials that they went through and they were different trials and the wisdom behind it. The ultimate wisdom is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in chapter of Hud, verse number 120, when he says, When you have read through the stories of the prophets, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And all of these stories that we have told you from the news of the prophet is that which makes your heart firm, solid. It makes your heart firm and solid. And there has come to you in this truth, instruction, and reminder for the believers. So the purpose of these stories ultimately is to make your heart firm. And this is so very important. I remember when I first read this verse, 
subhanAllah, it really made me say, you know, to myself is that, you know, Islam, religion in itself is a process. One should never think that they are quote unquote holier than thou or better than someone else. They realize that they have their flaws, but Allah just hasn't exposed your flaws to everyone. It may be, may be to certain people. And that person that knows has a responsibility in front of Allah also. But all of this is a process. It's a process. So when we say religiosity, the definition of that is what? Is where one tries their level best to make their hearts firm in certainty of God, who he is and who he is not. And how do I actualize that in my life? The best people that exemplified that were the prophets. So when we look at the chapter of Hud, we look at the examples of that of people that embodied the process of Islam, rejection, physical abuse, ridicule. When we face that in our lives, we should look back at the lives of the prophets and then see how they handled it and realize throughout that process, we will make mistakes in trying to be like them. But the more you do that, the stronger you will be as long as your intention is straight. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, bihi to make your hearts firm. Something that is thabit is something that is well-rooted. You're well-rooted. Your relationship with Allah is rooted in faith, trust, honor, love, respect, gratitude. When you look at all the names and attributes of Allah, you should see how it's actualized in your life and know that it demands a response from you towards him. So when you continuously go through that, looking at your children, looking at what Allah has given you, and you remember Ar-Razaq, you remember Al-Qawi, you remember Ar-Rahman, the, the provider who has given me this, the one who has strength to bring this here and take it away, the one that has mercy, withholding harm from me, and, and when, he, when and how he chooses to do it, it's totally up to him. But I have total trust in him. That's the relationship that all the prophets went through. So he says that we have made to make your hearts firm on that. And then he says, Where Allah SWT says, and in that comes to you in this truth. We say truth, instruction, and reminder. And mo'ida is a is very interesting word because firstly he says haq. Firstly, it's important for you, as you know, Mashallah's organization is yaqeen, certainty. You know, that to be certain, it's a process for you to obtain that certainty. The initial iman that you have, I believe that there is one God, he's the creator, the sustainer, that demands from me, you know, th those names demands for me to worship him alone. But the actualization of that, when you face trials and tribulations, to activate that belief is where the trial may come in for you. When you fight those desires, another trial. But all Allah wants for you to do is to try your best. And that's the process that takes place. So when you believe that this is the haq, you know where to resort to, who to turn back to, what message to turn back to. And that's this message that he says, the haq. And the mo'idha, the mo'idha can be understood as a reminder and depending on the situation and admonishment for you. It's something that when you read it, it makes you stand straight. It, it, it's a final frontier for you at times where you say, okay, what choice am I going to make? I know that this verse is talking directly to me. I open the Quran and I see that verse immediately. Subhanallah. What does that demand from me? So mo'ilah and dhikra and a reminder. A reminder of something that you've known previously. So it's something that you've known previously to remind you of the haqq, which serves as a mo'ilah for you. It's something that you've known previously to remind you of the truth that you had allegiance to with your soul, that serves as an admonishment for you. And that is these beautiful, beautiful, illustrious individuals that Allah has chosen to tell you a message. And that's why the prophets, Allah uses them as vessels through their experiences to remind you that you should be thankful to him. And that's why he said these qasas are there. And what's very beautiful is at the tail end of that, and this is the third to last verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings one of the greatest ahsan al-qasas, and that is the story of Yusuf. So just as Sheikh Omar alluded to with the beautiful, the beautiful tartib and organization of the Quran that has been chosen, by whom Allah has chosen to organize the sword, we see the beauty of how right after that, it gets you ready to tell you about one of the other prophets, Yusuf alayhi salam. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those 
that continuously monitor our hearts to make them firm upon him and his beautiful names and attributes. And so now we get into Surah Yusuf and we should mention subhanAllah for the benefit of everyone, Surah Yusuf is very different from all the other surahs about the prophets because it's revealed all about Yusuf as one story, complete story from start to finish. Whereas in, in Surah Hud, you get many other prophets, Surah Yunus, you get many other prophets, but Yusuf السلام, the noble brother of our beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, whose life every single element you know i don't know a single person as extreme as the life of yusuf السلام, was is there anyone that can't relate to that surah that doesn't find comfort when they read that surah subhanallah i mean i don't know anything of what he knows but it's just every element of his life lends itself to something that is beneficial for us so sheikh abu abad sheikh muhammad shanawi tafadhal sheikh Assalamu alaikum everybody. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah, ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakallah khairan, first of all, uh, for inviting me and uh, allowing me for a change to, to benefit, alhamdulillah. I actually haven't been hearing too many reminders in the night time, at least in Ramadan. Uh, and it actually is very difficult for me to speak about Surah Yusuf, uh, though I love the Surah dearly, but... Uh, I actually was involved in uh, translating. I translated a book that was the summary of an encyclopedia on Surah Yusuf. Uh, it's still under print. Uh, and so the, the, the thoughts do crowd one another quite a bit. So forgive me if I'm incoherent from the get-go, inshallah. Uh, but as Sheikh Omar uh, handed off saying, the, the amount of comfort and consolation that Surah Yusuf lends to anyone being distressed, anyone plagued with sadness, uh, is what led some of the early Muslims to say, how can someone ever grieve, meaning grieve to the point of being broken by their griefs, when they have, uh, when they have with them, Allah has revealed to them the surah of Yusuf alayhi salam, who was devastated at the very onset in the way that he was. And there's so much to talk about, but first of all, you know, I see in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, you know, the, the story of devastation that can almost not be outdone. Uh, sometimes death is easier than prolonged separation and unexpected betrayal. And Surah Yusuf is not just about sadness, it is about the type of sadness that comes from being betrayed from where you least expect it, which is what betrayal is, right? Like if someone were to get into like a conflict on the road and they, they exchange you know, offensive words and then someone like swings at them or slaps them across the face, they would be shocked, but they would be far more shocked to be slapped by a family member or someone where they never expected it from. And so that's what adds to the uh, the shock factor and the emotional wound that lingers that I never thought it would come. And so Surah Yusuf is really about a type of people as well, a people that are less expecting to be hurt by others because of how pure hearted they are. They can't imagine hurting others, right? And so they're hurt all the, that much more when they are hurt by others. There's a certain like vulnerability that comes about for most people due to the beauty of their hearts, the, the purity of their hearts, their innocence. It's not just the innocence of a child who could never imagine that people could be so evil as to throw their own brother down a well. A person, when he tries to keep his heart pure, one of the ways he does that is to try to dismiss these notions that that person could ever be that bad. And that opens a huge door for uh, for being assailed, for being wounded emotionally uh, and for long periods of time. Like most human beings don't have the capacity of Umar radiallahu an. Uh, Umar used to say, I'm not a trickster, nor can tricksters trick me, right? <laughs> like I'm not a conniving guy, but you know, the people that are mischievous will not be able to, I've been around the block, I understand how it works, it's not going to happen. Most people are not Umar. You're either going to you know, bury your innocence and become callous and allow the cold hearted people throughout the years to make you a carbon copy of themselves, which is the greatest victory of your enemies, right? Or you're going to be so devastated because of your good assumptions of others and what that sets you up for. That's the first thing. Uh, the, the second thing, I only mentioned three very quickly about Surat Yusuf that really stuck out, stuck out to me. The, se the second of them is something that was mentioned by, uh, uh, by Sayyid Qutb, rahimahullah, to be honest. Sayyid Qutb has his famous reflections on the Qur'an in the shade of the Qur'an. And the reason I mentioned the author, and it's important, not just for the credit, but because he was a person that got his education outside of his native land. And so like he was born 
I guess he felt what we sometimes talk about, that we need to be careful of American exceptionalism, realize the context in which we live in and the world does not revolve around us and how deluded we could be. Uh, he actually writes about that at the end of Surah Yusuf. He says, listen, Yusuf alayhi salam went through four tests in his life that were increasingly hard, but people only noticed the first three. And this is just, this is probably the number one gem that I've ever uh, read regarding the, the arrangement within Surah Yusuf. He says first he was thrown into the well, and this is the, the test of patience, patience with Allah's qadr, and that is mandatory. You need to do that, and it's for your own good because you can't change it anyway. And so it's even logical. Even a non-Muslim would understand that I should be doing this. Even a non-believer would understand I need to be doing this. It's not about particularly believing in Allah. It is like a survival mechanism, right? Be patient, accept what is fated, and you know, dodge with, you know, with the punches, as they say, roll with the punches. He says then the second one was a harder test when he was not locked in a well against his will, when he chose to go into the prison, right, to get locked into the prison to obey Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was voluntary. So that was an even more difficult test. And he passed that test to be of those who are pleasing to Allah. Azza wa Jal. He said then he came out and then he was garbed in his kingdom and his brothers came along and then he chose... <clears throat> to forgive his brothers, which was a much harder test because that test is a higher level. It's not even mandatory. It is mandatory on you to not fornicate, right? It is mandatory on you to just uh, ask Allah for strength and bear the consequences to the end of it. It's not mandatory on you to forgive people. It is certainly commendable. It's certainly virtuous. It's amazing. Not mandatory, right? It's, justice is mandatory. Being gracious is not. Uh, and so he even passed that test. But then when his family all came around, uh, at the conclusion of the surah, this is the part where Sayyid Qutb rahimahullah says, there was one final test before he says that the curtains of the story come down, just before it ends. There's one final scene that Yusuf alayhi salam from his great virtue, his great piety didn't miss. He welcomed his father, welcomed his brothers, they prostrate to him, the climax, the culmination, the manifestation of the dream in front of him. Then he turns away from them. He almost like steps aside and says, Rabbi qad min al -mulk. Oh my Lord, you have granted me kingdom. Min al -ahadith. And you taught me the interpretation of events and or dreams. Uh, -samawati wal -ard. You're the originator of the heavens and the earth. Then he says, Anta dunya wal You are my guardian in this world and the next. musliman wa alhiqni salihin allow me to die now a Muslim and allow me to catch up with the righteous, reunite me with the righteous on the other side in the hereafter. He says that's the hardest test because those first three tests, as hard as they are and increasingly hard, the hardest test anyone will ever face in their life is actually the test of prosperity, the test of assuming you've arrived at the happy ending in this dunya when this dunya is not the ending. He says, many people pass the test of difficulty, relatively speaking, and far few people ever pass the test of prosperity. But Yusuf alayhi salam passed that fourth test, noticed it was a test when most people in that moment would get caught up and wouldn't notice. Uh, the last thing, uh, I think I have a minute. Do I have a minute or should I stop? You got, you got 10 minutes, sir. So no, no, I got a minute. <laughs> this is something I shared with my community the, the other day. Uh, and I remember when one of my shiuch, uh, when he first mentioned this, I was just staggered. I said, man, like this is, the Quran actually has this stuff. <laughs> like how much are we not catching? Because we're just not paying attention. There's something beautiful. And like it comes across in, uh, in translations. Sheikh Abdullah is laughing at me. I was much younger in my, I guess, journey. Uh, but I'm just being a little bit raw here. I was just boggled. Uh, it, and there, by the way, there's lots of literature out there, I'm not sure how much in the English language, about Surah Yusuf being a standalone proof on the divinity of the Quran. Uh, and so this is the, uh, the part where Yusuf, alayhi salam, the verse before, the one I just explained, before he steps aside and speaks to Allah and says, you're my guardian, I still need to die Muslim, in the presence of his father, his guardian. No, the verse before it, when he's actually welcoming them, he says, uh, Allah says, العرش, He lifts his two parents up onto the throne, and everybody falls prostrate to him, meaning in respect. Worship was never for anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They all fall and prostrate to him. 
and he says, oh, my dear father, this is the interpretation of my dream. My Lord has made it a reality, and he's been so good to me. He pulled me out of the prison, and he brought you all to me from the Bedouin life after Allah instigated between me and my brothers. But then he says, my Lord is so subtle, so subtle in everything that he does, so delicate, so kind, so subtle. Uh, <clears throat> he says, certainly he is the most knowing, the most wise. And this is straightforward. I mean, after you see how the events turn, Allah is the best of planners, knowing wise are the correct names to reflect on here. But there is something very special about those two names for Yusuf alayhi salam. Because if you rewind, this is what the Sheikh was, was catching. He says, if you rewind 30, 40 years, uh, you rewind 90 ayat in this surah, <laughs> you find that when Yusuf alayhi salam's father realized that his son is having a dream about being elevated. Yusuf uh, Ya'qub salam, knew this doesn't happen without a, a, a road of tribulations first. He taught him two names of Allah. He said, Inna Rabbaka Alimun Hakim. Your Lord is knowing wise. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the surah, Yusuf <laughs> salam, says it back to his father as if to say, Dad, you were right. Allah certainly is the knowing the wise. It's as if like carving or engraving those two names in Allah Azza wa, in his personality about Allah Azza wa Jal is what carried him through everything, no matter what it was. And so I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to benefit us and you with, with, with these short words and to illuminate our hearts and, and uh, our minds with understanding him and allow the Quran for us to be a, a dispeller of all our sadnesses in this world and a dispeller of the darkness of our graves when we, when we lay in there and uh, to be a, a security for us from the terror of the day that we stand out of our graves. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khair. Ahsant. Ahsanallah And I think um, it's important to uh, remember all the political prisoners, subhanAllah, that find such comfort in the surah. I've never talked to anyone incarcerated that does not find incredible comfort in the surah. Uh, and that's sort of the consistency uh, people that have been in prisons for for being people of truth and um, you know for no other reason but their truthfulness and this is where they find when they find that they've been separated from their families when they find that um, you know they've been doomed to a cell for the rest of their lives and then they read this surah and then subhanallah as you mentioned it reminded me of what Abdurrahman ibn Awf who said that we were tested with bala, with hardship, and we passed, but we we failed the test of prosperity, and um, you know that that was a very powerful reflection. And ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to reward you for it. When is the book coming out, uh, Sheikh? I'm not sure. I mean, this was IIPH, and IIPH was hit very hard by the war in Syria because they print in Lebanon, and the containers pass through Syria to get to the ports. So I'm not sure exactly. Uh, Zakallah. Well, we'll keep we'll keep everyone posted, inshallah. Uh, we we'll look forward to having you back. And again, uh, I think you know, just to remind everyone, please make dua for our brothers and sisters that are unjustly incarcerated all over the world. All the stories of people with Surah Yusuf just came to my mind as you were talking about that reference. So, Zakallah, Sheikhman. We'll look forward to having you uh, two more times, inshallah. Unless you choose to, you know, jump on, you're always welcome. And uh, please keep everyone in your du'a. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan.